Reading from the book of Isaiah 35, beginning at verse 4. Isaiah 35, beginning at verse 4. And it says this, Say to the fearful hearted, Be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water in the inhabitation of jackals. Where each lay there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there and a road and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come with sighing, with singing. With everlasting joy on their heads, they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I'm going to read you something, and I shake to read this because my daughters and my wife often remind me that I am in that age in life where I qualify for many of the senior discounts. But I'm going to read this anyway. This was written by someone who is young at heart. Listen closely. Remember, old folks are worth a fortune. Silver hair, gold in their teeth, stones on their kidney, lead in their feet, and gas in their stomachs. I have become a little older since I saw you last, and a few changes have come into my life since then. Frankly, I've become quite a frivolous gal. I'm seeing five gentlemen every day. As soon as I wake up, will power gets, out of my, gets me out of bed. Then I go to see John. Then Charlie Horse comes along, and when he is there, he takes up a lot of my time and attention. When he leaves, Arthur Ritus shows up. He stays all day. He doesn't like to stay in one place very long. He takes me from joint to joint. After such a busy day, I'm really tired and glad to be going to bed with Ben Gay. What a life. P.S. The preacher called the other day. And he said, at my age, I should be thinking about the hereafter. And I told him, oh, I do all the time. No matter where I am, in the parlor, upstairs, in the kitchen, or downstairs, in the basement, I ask myself, what am I hereafter? I read that to you to say this, that we are living in a time where Jesus said and Paul said, you got to rouse yourself because the world will become so evil. It will become so dominated by evil that if you're not careful, it will steal your love for God and the things of God. And one of the things that he will try to steal and the world will try to steal is your joy. We don't have to become victims of this evil planet, church. I need you to understand that we can do more than survive. We can thrive even in evil, evil times. Meghan Markle, Prince Harry's wife, made this statement. She said it is not enough just to survive something. That's not the point of life. You've got to thrive and feel happy. I heard her say that, and I said she is 99% right. We are not in the world and in Christ so that we can just survive. We are in Christ so that as Christians we can thrive. We are here to live victoriously. For Paul said in Romans 8.37, we've been made more than conquerors in this life, overcomers through the wonder-working power of Jesus Christ. But the reason that I said that Meghan Markle is only 99% right is this. While the desire of your father for his children is that we thrive, get this in your spirit, God's desire for you is not for you to be happy. Let me just talk to you for a moment. God really does not care if you are happy. Let me tell you why God doesn't care if you are happy. Happiness is based on happening. Listen to how the dictionary defines happiness. Characterized by good luck, fortunate, based on performance. It is based on how things are going at this time in my life. Everybody knows and has heard of happy hour, haven't you? 
Let me tell you something. They did a study on happy hour, and the reason that happy hour is so popular is that in the study they found that people generally wake up in a good mood. But as the day progresses, their mood starts to slide. The boss gets on their case. They start to wear down the monotony of the job, or they don't really like where they work, and some things happen that steal their happiness, and so they look forward to happy hour in order to revive their happiness. Listen closely. In John 6, 1633, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but cheer up, I have overcome this world. Now it's interesting that the word cheer is the Greek word chara, which means joy. Jesus said that in the world things will happen that will shake up your happiness, but you need to be filled with chara, with joy, because I have conquered the world for you. There's a song we used to sing when I was growing up. This joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. And since the world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. Now watch this. Isaiah 61, where it brings this prophetic word of Jesus, it declares that the spirit of the Lord is upon him to anoint him to do certain things, where he says he's been anointed to give us a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Right above it in verse 2, he says, I'm also anointed, listen now, to comfort those who mourn. How will he do it? Verse 3, I will give them the oil of joy for mourning. I will pour oil upon their heads that will anoint them to have joy. The word oil always refers to anointing. There is an anointing that can come from God that no matter what you're going through, he will anoint you to have joy. Now, I want you to hear what he says. There's a double emphasis in Philippians 4 and 4. It says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. The word rejoice actually needs to be hyphenated. It needs to say rejoice. In other words, it means to do it again and again and again and again. I had a cross-country coach. He would make us do this exercise. We would run in place, then we'd jump down and we would do push-ups, jump back up, run in place, jump down and do push-ups. And every time he wanted us to do it, he kept saying, and again, and again, and again. Drove me nuts. I said, can't you at least say again? He would say again, and again, and again, and again. Here's what he was saying. He was saying what Paul is saying to you and I. After you have had joy, then rejoice. After you've gone through something difficult, rejoice. In other words, ante up again and start having joy all over again. Keep doing it and doing it and doing it. But then he says always. Now, if you look at that, always and rejoice seem to mean the same thing, but they don't. Rejoice means to re-up, but always is very important because it does not refer to repetition. It is situational and circumstantial, meaning keep rejoicing, keep walking in joy, living in joy, displaying joy in spite of your circumstances, in spite of your present plight, in spite of what you're going through right now. re Rejoice. There is an anointing of God through the blood of Jesus that will cause you in the most difficult times of your life to have joy and keep on rejoicing in spite of what you're going through. Now, I want to talk about joy. What is God's part? But before we go there, let's define what joy is. Mr. Webster says in the dictionary, it is the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. It also says that joy is the strong feeling of happiness, a manifestation of happiness through an inward rejoicing or excitement. Now listen to me, church. That definition works for people who don't know Jesus. But to those of us who know Jesus, we have got to understand that we need to mature in the reality that there is a deeper definition of joy for us. There is this something or other that God does in our spirits that works on the inside of us when it seems that everything outside of us is falling apart. We have what I call a Psalm 23 peace that is sustained by a supernatural joy that cannot be found except in Jesus. Now watch this. 
Psychologists and neuroscientists have done all kinds of research into the anatomy of joy. They have mapped the pleasure centers of the brain. They have isolated joy genes in our DNA. They have identified the chemicals that stimulate pleasurable feelings. They have studied identical twins in order to explore environmental factors. Listen, I was studying this and I found out they even did research in an area that actually involved the tickling of rats in order to understand the psychology and the physiology of laughter. Has anybody heard a rat laugh lately? Now stay with me for a moment. There is something to be learned from these disciplines. There are physiological factors. There are physiological forces and environmental influences that indeed do affect a person's happiness. But joy, grab this church, scientists know where it doesn't come from. Numerous studies over many years have determined that joy is not linked to circumstances, to money, success, status, age, gender, ethnicity. Even physical health doesn't have any significant correlation to joy. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says that a merry heart, a happy heart, does good like a medicine, but it does not say that joy operates like a medicine. Listen, we saw proof of the reality that stuff does not make us happy. One one day I'm watching Oprah Winfrey, and on the Oprah Winfrey show, there had to be 30, 40, maybe 50 people in the audience, and Oprah comes up and says, I got a surprise for you, and Oprah comes out, and she says, everybody here, I'm giving you a brand new car. Now, everybody listen, I don't know about you, but if somebody gives me a brand new car, even if I don't like it, I'm not complaining. I will take that bad boy, and after a while, I will sell it and get what I want, but I'm not complaining. Do you know that there were people in that audience, a few weeks later, they were ticked off. They said, Oprah gave us a car, but they, she did not pay for the insurance. Happy that day, sad the next. Because listen, church, stuff does not get people what we need most, and that is joy. Happiness is from something we do. Happiness is from what happens to you and for you. Once the thing is gone, the happiness is gone. Once we have what we have and it's done or it's been given to us and it's gone, it's gone. Please write this down. Happiness is insecure. Happiness is insecure. That's why you can see people who are happy in the moment and they are in fear at the same time. Because the thing that made them happy, they're also fearing that they might lose that thing. To those who don't know Jesus, there is a mystery about where joy comes from. And I'm talking about real joy, not you just spurting out words saying, I've got joy. Watch this now. I'm talking about a joy that oozes from the life of the Christian. In spite of what they are going through, that joy is a a mystery and watch me now you can be saved and still don't know the mystery of joy because the joy that I'm talking about can only come when you have an intimate relationship with someone there are people who are married and don't know their spouse let me tell you why. Because you are not intimately intertwined. You got a marriage license. Your bodies got together. You may have had sex. You may have consummated the marriage. But you don't know each other because sex is not intimacy. There is an interlocking of spirit and heart that causes intimacy. And some people, they are saved, but you don't know God because you are not intimately intertwined with him. And there's a mystery to those who don't know Jesus intimately. And here's why. Galatians 5, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now watch this, church. Anytime you see all or most of these fruit of the Spirit displayed in someone's life consistently, please understand that it's not them doing it. Please understand it is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And Jesus says, I will by my anointing pour the oil of joy for mourning upon your life. I'm talking about a mysterious joy the joy that the world cannot comprehend. Now, everybody look at me. We have too many Christians who are miserable and insecure. Let me tell you why. 
Because we're always busy trying to be happy instead of being filled with the joy of the Lord. Let me talk to you for a moment. You young people and some of you older people, God, give me a wife, give me a husband, and I will be happy. And you know what? You are right. Believe me, a woman, a man can make you happy. It is the key to happiness. Meeting somebody and getting married is a key to happiness, but the same key that got you married can bring you misery if that relationship is not anchored in joy because the same person that makes you happy most of the time has the ability to tick you off to and make you unhappy. Let me explain it this way. Lady Brenda loves me. I know she loves me. She loves me. Oh, she loves me. But let me tell you what I know. There are times when she does not like me. And if you don't understand that, you will eventually end up in divorce court because you're basing your every decision on what makes you happy. Stay with me. There is an insecurity that comes with happiness. Listen, that is not present in joy. Write this down. Joy is secure. Now write this underneath that. Bishop is not worried about losing his joy. Just go ahead. Go write that down. You're going to look at that and go, I want that. Let me tell you why I'm not worried about losing my joy. Church, look at me. The reason I don't worry about losing my joy is because it's not mine. Joy comes from God. Listen to me now. You cannot lose what you don't have a grip on. You cannot lose what you're not holding on to. You cannot lose what you do not possess, what you do not own. You see, joy is not the thing that you're supposed to possess. Joy is supposed to possess you. Watch, because joy is a supernatural work, not an earthly work, not a natural work. It is not measurable. You can't explain it, but you can display it. Because 1 Peter 1 and 8 says, you rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. You got fired, but you got joy. Can't nobody understand it. She walked out on you. You got joy. Nobody can understand it. That is a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Why? Because you're rejoicing. Because it's a supernatural, unexplainable, unspeakable joy. And why is it that way? Because it's not yours. It's God's. Nehemiah 8 and 10. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. My joy belongs to God and it comes from God and God does not change. That's why my joy is, 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 is sure, it's secure, and I'm confident in it because it belongs to and it comes from God. And some of you need to hear this. It is time for you to start trusting God with your whole life. It is time for you to start trusting God with the mess you're in right now because you cannot and you will not have joy unspeakable and full of glory until you stop seeking happiness and begin to pursue the joy of the Lord. Let me illustrate it this way. Do you remember, and especially... Most of us who grew up in, in, in the baby boomer generation, when your mother would say, don't eat candy before meals, why did she say that? Because she knew that the candy would ruin your appetite for the next meal. The trouble with eating candy is that it gives us a sugar buzz, and then you don't feel hungry. Candy masks what the body really needs, and that is proteins and vitamins. The sugar buzz from candy masks your hunger for the real nutrients that you don't have. Stay with me for a moment, because in the spirit realm, things like sex and power and money and success, as well as favorable circumstances, they act like spiritual sugar. Christians who have these spiritual candies they say silly things like, yes, I believe in God and I'm going to heaven. But what you are missing is that you don't understand is that you are actually basing your day-to-day -day joy on favorable circumstances on being happy. And here's the problem. When your circumstances change most of the time because you're on a spiritual sugar high, the thing that ought to be drawing you to God, it drives you away from God because you will never satisfy the appetite of what you really need. You don't need more spiritual sugar. You don't need no more any more candy. What you need is the joy of the Lord and that is a supernatural work of the Spirit. You're craving today. So what is God's part? Number one, God's joy gives the oil of joy for mourning. 
We read it in Isaiah 61, 3 through 7. He says, I will give them the oil of joy for mourning. The word oil is the Hebrew word shimen. What it means is this. It is a healing medicine. God says that no matter what condition your heart is in, no matter what you're going through, I will give you an oil of joy that will heal your broken heart. Number two, God's joy puts joy back in your salvation. Watch now. David said in Psalm 51, 10 through 12, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in, within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your spirit from me. Watch now. Restore the joy of salvation, and uphold me with your generous spirit. Everybody look at me. How many of you know people who are saved, and you can't stand to be around them? They are the most miserable, wretched people on earth. What you have to understand is that salvation is supposed to bring joy, not misery. You can still be saved and yet be miserable. Why? David said this, when I kept silent about my sin, I was tormented. You see, sin will do that to you. It will make you look outwardly to everybody else like your life is just everything is all right while eating away at the fiber of your spirit and your soul like acid. But what I want you to see is this, when when David confessed his sin, it was because he understood there is no feeling that is worse for the Christian than to be flatline in your joy of your salvation because when your joy goes flatline, the peace of God goes flatline. And let me tell you something, sin always takes you farther than you ever want it to go. It causes a spiritual drift which turns and it dims your joy. And God is saying to some of you today, you need to repent of sin sin in your life. And he says, I'll restore to you the joy of your salvation. Listen to me just for a moment. Some of you need to understand today. You don't need, there is nothing wrong with this church. God knows there's nothing wrong with the preacher. I know I live with him. God knows there is nothing wrong with the people in this church. There is nothing. You don't need another church. You don't need another environment. What you need to do is repent of sin so that the joy of the Lord can come back into your salvation. There is going to be nothing worse than getting to heaven. Some of us are going to be standing up in heaven in our nice three-piece suits. Everything's going to be creased and in place, standing next to some of y'all. You're going to be raggedy, tore up from the floor up, beat up all over the place, looking like you just barely made it into heaven and the reason is was because you lost the joy of your salvation and the reason is sin couldn't steal your salvation but it stole your joy the bible says in acts 3 19 repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out then the times of refreshing will come from the lord Number three, God's joy makes us full. Psalm 16 and 11, you will show me the path of life and in your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. It means complete, no lack, no shortage. We read about Romans 11, 33 through 36, and we were talking about the peace. All those things that we need are in him, not just our peace, but our joy is in him. And number four, God's joy is an everlasting joy. Here's where we're going to hang out for the remainder of this message. Isaiah 35 and 10, and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Now let's define everlasting. Everlasting means perpetual, without end. It means lifetime. Not being limited to the present. Continuity without change. Perpetual, without end, lifetime. Not being limited to the present. Continuity without change. How many of you know some sometimey people? Let me talk about sometimey people. Sometimes they got peace. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they got happiness. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they feel like a nut. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> Sometimes they got joy. Sometimes they don't. Sometimey people. Look at me. As a Christian... God says, you don't have to be sometimey. I've got a joy that will endure. It will be perpetual. It will stay on you no matter what you're going through. The Bible says that God can give you an all-time joy, an everlasting joy, a joy that does not change because you've got problems. 